Hi, hi, everybody. Hello. Hello, Andrew. Hi, Good to Colin. see you. Uh, oh, likewise. <laughs> likewise, uh, likewise. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everybody. Just waiting for people to come. Hi, hi. Please, uh, yeah, just let us know where you're, where you're coming, viewing from, you know, and uh, just uh, comment and like and share our video to those people who are interested. Today, we're just doing a commentary of uh, what we have been talking about for the last uh, Zooming, the last long time ago, the Zooming in with Gems. And uh, hi, everyone. Hi, thanks. For, oh, I can see people coming in from the Gem Museum. And uh, hi, everybody. Uh, wonder if you all miss me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so today I have a companion. Uh, his name is Andrew and he's our curator at the museum. And today we're having a lunchtime jam talk. Right, Andrew? Yes, we are sacrificing our lunch time to talk, to talk <laughs> about jams with you all, you know. <laughs> yeah, wow. I'm actually quite excited to go and have food, you know. Yeah, but anyway, we have a wonderful uh, lineup today about some stones. So we're just letting a few more people come in from the from the Facebook. Hi, everybody. Uh, feel free to comment. And those of you who are first time using uh, watching us, you can go to streamyard.com slash Facebook to enable uh, Streamyard to have permission access to your name and picture so that we can see who are you. Uh, feel free to, to interact with us, you know, post any questions. Today, we are just we are going to talk about uh, Papraja, we're going to talk about the zircon, we're going to talk about uh, emeralds, and one more, salt and pepper mm -hmm. diamonds, yeah. yeah. Just a recap of our our Zooming in with Gems, I think last year during Circuit Breaker, we actually had a Zooming in with Gems, you can also catch us on YouTube, uh, and uh, yeah, so today is like a response video. So uh, Andrew, why not uh, we, we, we sh you share the, the slides? Okay, sharing. Okay, here it is. Okay, at stream. Yes. All right. So here we go. Okay. So everybody, today we are, what's the first topic? Oh wow, that's oh. a nice picture of us, huh? <laughs> too soon. Too soon. <laughs> too soon. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's go, Andrew. All right. Well, why do you do this? Huh? It looks funny, you know. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a talk, right? So, and then we want to emphasize on this gem talk. And it's actually our first time doing it um, during uh, lunchtime, talking about gems. So try to make it, you know, relax a little bit. Try to make it funny also, not too serious, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hang on, I'm going to get a charging cable. Oh. I think my, 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 my headphones is running out of battery. Yeah, I can hear yours a little bit fuzzy. Yeah, so um, like Komi mentioned, we are uh, talking about our past webinars that we have done during our Circle Breaker last year. So the cover topic for today will be the salt and pepper diamonds, a paparasha, zircon versus zirconia, and also emerald. Okay. So these are the topics for today. Okay, let's jump into the first topic. Okay, so before that, let's talk about the objective of this uh, gem talk first, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's important now. So um, like we have mentioned many times, it's been a year since we have done our first webinar. So um, by talking about our past webinar, uh, our first uh, aim is to connect with our past and also new audience audiences okay and um, also by doing the webinars we also receive a lot of questions during the webinar and also um, visitors that visited the museum that watched the webinar as well and then to also to recap past webinars which is what we're trying to do also and again to share the questions asked by visitors of the Gem Museum to you all. And that are, that is, um, these are our objective for today, okay? All right. Okay, so for the first topic, salt and pepper diamonds. Um, 
I'm not sure how many of you watching right now watch the, this webinar. Um, it's our first webinar uh, in the Gem Museum history. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a little bit, um, you know, like how new, how we do new things. There's, there's a lot of hiccups and whatnot, but overall we did quite well. But uh, salt and pepper diamonds back in the days was, uh, I mean, it's quite a trend. Okay. So we talked about diamonds that contains tiny black and white inclusions or also known as impurities. Okay. So here are some of the questions that um, that is being asked before, right? So throughout the, uh, we, all, we will also share some of these slides that being taught during the webinar itself, like what you can see in the picture at the, in below. So above are some of the questions like, can other gemstones be salt and pepper too? Because we talked about diamonds, diamonds that contains black and white inclusions. So some of the questions are like, is there any gemstones that can be salt and pepper too? So a... Yeah, wow. So where do hmm. you get this question, uh, actually, Andrew? Is that a visitor or, or you found it on somebody asking on, on our Zoom, Zooming with, with gems? Yeah, I would say majority of the questions here are from the visitors from the gem museum. Yeah, oh. so I really have to recall, you know, like the questions being asked, so I just put it into the slides. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, I think this question is a is a is a good question. How can can other gemstones be salt and pepper too? Any one of our live uh, viewers, if you want to comment, just uh, type in the comments and uh, let us know what you think. And uh, yeah, I, I think because salt and pepper is a trade name, so you know. Uh, we always humans are we are always very interesting we like to create ideas you know create a uh, new ways to to share things you know and to market the diamonds and uh yeah um for like like some stones that have a lot of uh, inclusions uh are root related quartz you know you can see black inclusions in them and uh i even have uh i have uh we have some aquamarine here also there's black inclusions in them Sometimes they are rutao, sometimes they are just uh, tourmaline. You know, I, I last week we had uh, two young boys coming to the museum. You weren't around that time. Uh, they were looking for black tourmaline in quartz. So, oh. So it's like it's like a thought like that lah, But it's we don't see the haziness of it. Yeah. Hi, mm. Tsihao. Hello, hello. Good to see you. Good to see you. So uh, what? Yeah. So. Maybe, uh, yeah, other gemstones can be salt and pepper too. What do you think, Andrew? Yeah, um, when we talk about generally salt and pepper, uh, they are inclusions. So gem natural gemstones, they tend to be included with impurities. So in terms of the black salt and the, uh, sorry, the black pepper and the white salt, maybe uh, not too many gemstones would have this kind of impurities. Yeah, but in terms of inclusions, yes, they would have inclusions like crystals, like root tiles, like any, any, other, any other thing that you can imagine, you know. So yeah, it's a trade name. It's, one thing about gemstones is it inspires people to give attractive names to the gemstone like salt and pepper, you know. When you see something, oh, it reminds me of salt and pepper, and then you just give salt and pepper, and yeah, yeah, yeah. we we do see a lot of trade names, names that we never heard before, we never studied before, and yeah, every day maybe new names will come out. You see. Yeah, so I guess trade names are, you know, they they don't really have a proper definition written on paper, and uh, it's something that you know, as a buyer, if you buy stones, uh. Uh, hui Ying is saying having lunch now salt and pepper just nice <laughs> yeah as you buy gemstones you know um do do take note of trade names because sometimes trade names uh you know it's like it's a nice way of saying it but then you don't know what exactly is the stone yeah for salt and pepper diamonds it's uh, just uh, diamonds that with black and white inclusions all together uh you have the next question you say what happens when the gem only has salt or pepper alone Hmm. 
Okay. Um, I think what this question refers to, where if this diamond only has salt or even pepper alone, can it still called salt and pepper diamond? A, I'm not sure. What do you think, Kumi? Uh, well, for the white diamonds, we do have some in our collection. They are called uh, opalescent. So these diamonds that are totally white, they are hazy. Uh, when you send it to GIA, it actually gets a grading uh, called uh, fancy white. And then uh, so far, yeah, I haven't really heard of salt diamonds. You know, unless mm. you really put salt, la, like having, having a lunch now, you know, put salt, salt diamonds. Mm -hmm. And then uh, pepper, pepper diamond is like, uh, nah, I don't, I don't really, I don't really uh, hear this before. Mm. Yeah. Mm, but Am I a little bit uh, soft? No, no, you're, you're fine. You're fine. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. That's good. But I think we do see a lot of diamonds that have pepper in terms of the graphite inclusions. Yeah, I think we have yeah, seen quite a number of those. What do you think of those? I think it's just um, included diamond, maybe a, a low quality, maybe S, SI or even I range diamonds. Uh -huh. Yeah, but I never seen someone use the pepper alone, like pepper diamond or salt, or salt diamond yeah. in that case. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. So, uh, yeah, moving along, what's the, yeah, so I think this is a great slide because we talk about, uh, does it mean it's a low-grade diamond? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Andrew, what do you think? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> ball back to you. <laughs> right, diamonds, obviously, clarity is one of the uh, major uh, quality for, I mean, how do I say, I, one of the biggest aspects in terms yeah. of the... Yeah, the four Cs, the major aspect in the quality of the diamond, the clarity, the one of the Cs mm. of the four Cs. Yeah. So when it has salt and pepper, naturally they have a lot of inclusions depending on how how visible they are. So yeah. if they do have a lot, like what you see in this picture, right, this kite-shaped diamond, which is so black on the top and the bottom part. So is Naturally, it will be graded as I diamond, which is the, the I3, right side of the chart. Yeah, probably I3. I3. I3, confirm. Mm, yeah, maybe the diamond on the right, maybe slightly I or I1 or I2, or maybe SI2 at, at, at best, you know. Yeah. You know, but, because yeah. I guess when people, when... Uh, when this uh when this uh, GIA graded started this grading system, uh it's really a grading system to grade the diamond as a in terms of what's the clarity range. So that actually takes out all the so called artistic because it's a very pragmatic idea of uh grading. Yeah. So to say that it's a low grade diamond, yes, according to the GIA clarity scale, yes. But then, does it mean that uh, it does not justify the value? Um, I, yeah, yeah. Please, uh, please uh, go ahead and ask questions. And uh, so I'll ask. Uh, welcome to ask questions. Yeah, you can just post there. If we can uh, have some time, we will reply. Yeah. And video is stuck. Well, sometimes uh, the the reception network, but uh, it's, it's just hang on a while. Yeah, so uh, does it mean it's a low-grade diamond, Andrew? Yes. Uh, well, based on the GIA, a clarity scale is it is a low-grade diamond. But when it comes to artistic point of view, uh, I don't think you should let this clarity scale limit your artistic view because people do use salt and pepper diamonds in uh, jewelries maybe high-end jewelry as well, depending on how you see the di diamond, you see. Yeah, I see the trend is mostly in uh, Europe and uh, the US, especially on Etsy, Etsy stores. You can actually go mm. to Etsy stores, you just search salt and pepper diamond, you will see a lot of people selling them. And they are very nice way of selling because they, they kind of give you a, a reflected light view. Then you click on it, right? Then they show you the internal inclusions of the stones. 
So, of course, you, you don't want to buy a stone with a lot of fractures. You know, if just carbon spots, huh, I think it's uh, very unique. I, I, I once sold a 0 0.71 fancy purplish pink diamond before. And the stone was, I think, SI1 or SI2. But the beautiful thing of the stone, right, is everything in the stone was carbon spots, was carbon crystals. It was wow. not like cracks or everything. So it looks fantastic because when you cut the when you cut the stone uh, uh, you, in the cushion shape, uh, all the small black spots uh, are the extinction spots of the, from the cutting, right? It looks like the mm -hmm. black spots. So you don't really see the inclusion. So, yeah, I think artistically, there's a value to it because these stones are all millions to billions of years, especially for diamonds. They're very old. And uh, I think if you, I think if you, uh, how to say, uh, if you, I mean, you have to appreciate them, uh, I guess, you know, appreciating them and also appreciating the value. And uh, definitely trends come and go, but I think salt and pepper has been around for quite some time already. Uh. Mm. Andrew. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, definitely been quite some time. It's just how people utilize them, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, let's go on to the next slide. So now as a question, other than GIA, what other agency institutions that can send stones for green? There are many, many, what are the labs can be sent for? Yeah, there are many labs that can be sent for grading. Uh, what do you think of GIA? Well, I, I, I only saw one time at this uh, People's Park Center, there was this shop selling with it, and then it looks very similar to GIA. So I'm just wondering, you know, where, are they the, the same thing or not? But anyway, the, yeah, just do check with GIA. Just send an e email to GIA and uh, send them a copy of the cert to just make sure, you know, there's always a report check on uh, GIA and you can check. Um, there are many uh, labs grading out there. Uh, yeah, so feel free to check up on their history, you know, get, get on forums and ask people about their qualities and everything. And uh, also check their charges. Some, some labs charge really low. You know, of course, it doesn't mean they're no good, but of course, you have to check on the certifications, the kind of uh, equipment they use, what kind of grading standards do they use? Do they adhere to the GIA grading standard uh, for diamonds? Or, or do they use another grading standard such as HRD or even AGS? So these are some questions that you can ask and uh, yeah, you can check before uh, sending your stones for certification. Yeah, what's next? Huh? So... Are salt and pepper diamonds widely available in the current market? I'm not sure about the current market. I don't buy stones. I think this question is more towards you, your side, Komei. Yeah, I, I think I think it's so far I, I checked in Singapore. I, I only I mean running the King's Bespoke for uh, for engagement rings, right? I only received one request one or two requests last uh, last six months yeah and then if i check on uh, online uh, do a google search the other day i don't really see uh, singaporean stores on google uh, publicizing uh, salt and pepper diamonds uh, I, of course there are many other uh, ways of uh, selling maybe on carousel maybe on uh, on uh, other other platforms but so far on google I, when i do a search i don't really see any any like a Singaporean company trying to promote uh, salt and pepper diamonds. Yeah, even I asked some suppliers, uh, they say, hey, I don't know, uh, I, don't, I don't have this kind of stone, eh. you know. So I think, I think in terms of uh, available, widely available, you definitely you can buy it. Uh, I think I went on some Etsy stores, uh, especially from the Europe and the America. They, they are really very specialized in selling these diamonds and some of them are really very beautiful. Uh, this picture in the in the in the in the photo in the what the photo in the powerpoint it's a stone that i i had in my in my collection for a short while somebody brought it and showed one of the suppliers showed it to me and i just thought i took a photo of it and uh yeah these are some some of this quality because of course mainstream uh, jewelers don't really use this so much because uh i don't know i think one of the one of the issues i i i, I faced when buying these stones is the clarity enhancement sometimes they put uh they call it uh what they call it yahuda what is it uh, yahuda the drilling and then they put uh 
they put some kind of a resin, you know. They, I think they remove some kind of a, a, through laser drilling and then they remove. Yeah, there was one time I, I went to South Africa. Yeah, I was in South Africa in 2020 and I went to a, an office to look at some diamonds. I asked for salt and pepper diamonds. So he showed me one whole parcel. Then as I begin to look at the parcel, I, I realized inside there's like a, you know, pinkish film, you know. So it shows that it has been uh, clarity treated. Lah. So of course, these are some things that uh, you can actually look out for. But actually, it's really beautiful. Very, very uh, unique patterns and all this. Let's go to the next slide, Andrew. Okay, thank you for that. So the next slide, we're going to start to talk about the Paparasha, which is the king of sapphires. And what is Paparasha? I'm sure a lot of people heard of Paparasha before. It's a very popular sapphire apart from blue sapphire. And it's an orangey pink corundum that many consider the most beautiful and the rarest of sapphires. All right. So a, during the webinar itself, um, I did show this slide, the properties of sapphire. Is uh, The hardness of it is 9 on the most hardness scale. And it says the third hardest. Uh, okay, It didn't say what third hardest of gem or mineral or whatever. So here is to clarify this, um, this slide. Okay, Ruby and sapphires are the second hardest natural gemstone. Okay, mm. and is the third hardest material behind diamond and silicon carbide, also known as moissanite. Okay, so when it comes to natural gemstones, they are the second hardest gemstone in the market. So um, moissanite, as we all also know, that is man-made. Um, is very, very extremely rare in nature. Okay, so it's not really used. They don't really use natural moissanite in jewelry, so apart from man-made itself. So mm. this is to clarify this slide. All right. And next, how to define paprasha color? Okay, is uh, yeah, is a lot of visitors. I mean, visitors that actually buy gemstones. A, they will always ask this same question: How do we define paparasha's color? And is uh, I mean, it's a how do you say it's an issue? Is it an issue? I would say it's an issue uh, that's been going on for a long, long time. There, there seem to be no end to it because everybody sees color differently, and how people grade the color is also uh, slightly different too. So. This slide is shows the um, is best to illustrate the paparasha's color um, by depicting a pink lotus flower being struck by a sunset orange light. So you can imagine the body color, the pink body color of the sapphire, plus a little bit of orange look, orange tint to it. Okay. This is a great uh, description, Andrew. This is a great description. Yes. Uh, we, so far, um, wow, I need my earphones. Uh, the thing drop out. Hang on. Uh. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, those of you who like what you are hearing now, if you think of anybody that is interested in Papraja, uh, please do like and share the video and uh, let them know, tag them into this, uh, into this live. So uh, I think this is a great introduction. I mean, not a great, a great description. Uh, lotus flower, which is pink, and then with the sunset on it. Uh, look, viewing the lotus flower in the sunset environment, so you get that papraja kind of look. Uh, we have somebody, Philip, Philip, Philip Flipper. Just now, he 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 said something. How do you grade this for the for the salt and pepper diamonds? Actually, currently there's not there's uh, so far we I haven't seen a actual cut a grading system yet. But because yeah, I haven't seen a grading system. You can use the GIA grading system, but then there's more like you're grading the into the transparency, transparent. I mean, or the white diamonds, this clarity scale. Salt and pepper diamonds will go in the included the I series, SI two to I three series. So that's how you will grade the clarity. But in terms of you know how the artistic, how how it goes, that is really your your personal preference and also your personal liking. Yes. Mm. So uh, let's go. Uh, yeah, any comment on that? Okay, go to Papraja. So the next slide, please. Okay, so right. Um, because just I think... now, uh, Andrew, sorry, just now you were saying that there was like mm. no end to the definition. So 
the next slide actually answers that that, that ending. Yes. So this slide, um, uh, if you look at the quote on the bottom left, okay, LMHC, which is the, uh, what's it called again? Laboratory, laboratory, three, harmon ha what? Harmonize harmonization, harmonization Com committee. Yeah. Committee, is yeah. this, okay, this committee actually governs the, I think the laboratory, gem gemological laboratory around the world. And it come up, comes up with this definition on how to grade the paparasha's color, all right? So it says the color is a subtle mixture of pinkish orange to orangey pink with pastel tone of low to medium saturation under standard daylight. So it still says pinkish orange to orangey pink and it can be, the color range can be quite wide as well. If you look at this slide over here is, I mean, all of them can be considered paparasha in the market, right? Wow. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> and yeah, and, and we actually asked the audience back during the webinar, we actually asked them to choose which one do you think would you consider paparasha color, right? And we, and, yeah, and Kobe, we do have a lot of mixed uh, answers as well, you know? Yeah. You remember? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, personally, I think number five, number five and seven, Number three, I kind of like the colors. Five, three, five, seven. How about mm. our viewers in the live? What, what do you think? You all, what do you think? You all can just comment on the comment below. Just type in three or five or seven. You know, what do you all think that is a paparaja color that you all would like and you would like to own? Mm. Well, Andrew, what's your, your take? Yeah. I personally think five as well. I think five is the best description to, for a paparaja's color. Yeah, you can mm. see the whole pinkish body with a slight tint on the top right. Uh, I think that is the best description for Paprasha. Wow. David, hey, hi, David. Hi, Mohammed. Uh, Mohammed says six. Six. Oh, mm. yeah, okay. David says five. And then uh, El Lo says uh, five also. But so far, five is like the con, is the one. So those of you who are watching this live, yeah. So now you know many people will choose five. So if you buy a Papraja, you can use this slide uh, as a gauge. Okay, but <laughs> one thing is, uh, one thing that I, I don't touch Papraja because of the grading system is, is, is really determined by the, is determined by the lab. Lah. So let's say if, if you, you buy from this lab, you might not get that lab grading, you know, that's why the LMHC, the Laborat uh, Laboratory Harmonization Council, it's good to know who are in this lab, Laboratory Council, so that you know, okay, for all these five labs, they should have the same kind of grading. Yeah. Mm. Uh, one chick where, one chick where says, what is the difference between Papraja and Padmaranga? Well, what do you think, Andrew? Um, what's the... Paparasha and what again? I can't see the name of because, the. Because, uh, you you is is a uh, Padmaranga. Padmaranga. Uh, I heard of it, but I can't recall what it is. A. I guess oh. it's a language thing, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a yeah, it's a language. Uh, I think used in Sri Lanka itself. I think it's also mm. referring to Paparasha. Um, okay. it's just yeah, language. Mm. Okay. Okay, so it's the same thing by its language, but yeah, of course, you know, uh, depending on the culture, so uh, one one cheat where I think you 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 could clarify with the person who's uh telling you about it, you know, clarify because sometimes uh because gemstone is so international, everybody uh understands it a little bit different, so it's good to have a picture to show them. Oh, is it this color? You know, and and this before going to collect them. Yeah. Mm. So Hui Ying says she liked number six. Uh, so this uh, Mohammed summary also liked. And then uh, I suspect my choice was different during the webinar. Yeah. So I guess, uh, Andrew, you know, color is something very according to your choice and also mood. Uh. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yes, definitely. Definitely. I will always tell the visitors of the museum, you know, just go with what you like rather than what people say. 
because in the end what you see color may be slightly different as well and what you like what color you like is also different too mm. yeah let's go to the next slide okay so here shows how does treatment affect the paparashas market um, I've seen a lot of news that saying paparasha is uh, widely treated. I mean, it's, it is widely treated, um, but depends on what kind of treatment people use it on the sapphire itself. So most of the sapphires, uh, paparasha, in fact, they are heat treated. I mean, not to say most all of them, but most of them to achieve that orangey pink tone. And um, heat treatment itself is widely acceptable, right, Koming? Yeah, it's widely acceptable. And, uh, but of course, disclosure is important. You need to tell your, the people, let's say you're selling the stone to somebody, you, you need to disclose it's heat treated. And uh, of course, it's better to get it with a certificate because uh, heat treatment got a few kinds. Uh, one, of the, one of the history of Paparaja which uh, saw the collapse in the Japanese market was because of beryllium diffusion. So many people were love this color. This color was very beautiful. And then uh, people were buying it, but then there was no disclosure. At the time, beryllium was new. So everybody bought it as uh, just a heat treated stone, you know. But later on, they found out it's, it's actually an additive of beryllium into the stone. So that really caused a lot of, uh, you know, not annoyance like you know when you buy a stone that is normally mm. treated but actually it's beryllium treated then because beryllium actually makes it uh, easier to get that color yes yeah. it's yeah it's considered artificial color because you add a foreign uh, chemical into the stone to achieve that kind of color rather than heat treating you just alter the the chemical within the stone itself to change the color mm. you see yeah. so a beryllium diffusion um is does it uh, does it affect the value of the stone i i think they do right i mean people can yeah. sell it as as natural paparasha i mean i mean you have to disclose it la. yeah yeah it's just that it's just that uh, it, it's also not that easy also to get uh the right the fire candidate for the treatment so it really boils down to the consumer how much you are willing to spend, how much you, are, how much you value it, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. Treatment, I think treatment does open up the market because it creates more supply, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and I haven't really, I've seen a few pieces of uh, so-called papraja in the last few weeks. There are no heat. Uh, color is pastel color, a bit lighter color. You don't see like very strong colors. Anyway, um, Papraja, you need to be pastel, like not vivid colors. Mm -hmm. yeah, so um, treatment does affect, it, it actually it opens up more supply. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just true. a matter of um, yeah, acceptance. La. You know, but still people want to buy a no heat, la. no heat sapphire, no heat uh, Papraja. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. let's go to the next slide. Okay, so Paparasha has ended. So now we're going to talk about Zircon and Zirconia, which is one of the uh, most asked topic uh, among the visitors of the Gem Museum. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes, seriously. When, because we do have a sample in one of our permanent showcase that's showing cubic Zirconia. And then they will just point at that, oh, is, is that real? And then, and then <laughs> when they... When I explain to them, okay, they were just, oh, really? Because I've seen it everywhere. It's used in many costume jewelries and many stores are selling zirconia. Yeah, they just use zirconia rather than cubic zirconia, which is the, uh, uh, the, the actual name itself. So it might confuse a lot of consumer uh, between zirconia and zircon, even, even diamonds. I mean, by the looks of it, cubic zirconia do look like diamond, you see. Yes. Right. So here's the uh, basic explanation of what are these two things. Um, zircon is a natural mineral found in numerous places, mainly used in jewelry and occurs in numerous colors as well. Mm. So whereas cubic zirconia is a man-made material to imitate diamond. Mm. Okay, So it's 100% man-made just to imitate diamond. 
but of course they do come in many different colors as well and yeah they're pretty easily made yeah um, if you want to know more about Cubis Organa you can watch the webinar you see okay so right this is the question right Z what zirconia mama I, zirconia mania <laughs> <laughs> yeah what is zirconia because it's literally everywhere um sold in costume jewelry they are quite they're very cheap okay when they're used with silver uh steel stainless steel they don't cost a lot because they are like i said it's easily made and they are quite abundant as well so zirconia basically they are made by the chemical of zirconium which is extracted from zircons um, it's just zircon they're made on earth whereas cubic zirconia they are made in a lab so it's one is oh. natural one is man-made okay so and yeah cubic zirconia although they do share the same chemical cubic zirconia is not synthetic zircon all right mm. Mm. so I it's uh yeah I you, you were saying something about cheap, uh, but do you know, uh, I realized there are actually different grade of uh, cubic zirconia. Oh, really? I never know. Yeah, because like sometimes, right, the cutting quality is, is different oh. and then the cost is like, is also, I mean, it's not, it's not, not, not cheap also, lah, because, and there's some of our branded, branded zirconia, uh, cubic zirconia. Oh. Yeah, so, so. Wow. I think I think the workmanship does play a part also for the quality of the cubic zirconia. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Let's mm. let's go on to the next slide. Okay. So the next question uh, I do get a lot is how do we identify these two? Well, it's uh pretty simple if you know where to look. Okay. So uh, we have two photos to. Uh, to show how do you identify these two. Okay, cubic zirconia, um, you can use the picture on number two, okay, number two as the cubic zirconia, which is, actually this is a diamond rather than a cubic zirconia, but it, um, they do have the similar optical properties as diamond, so I will use yeah. that photo instead. So, um, where if you compare it to zircon, which is photo number one, you can see if you look through one of the facets into the zircon, you would see a very obvious doubling. Okay. Yeah. Doubling is referred to if you look at the culet over here with the lines, the pavilion. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can see all the lines they are doubled. Yes. Okay. So it's not because cutters cut it double is the optical properties of the zircon that splits the light into two pathways for you to see mm. two lines. Oh. Okay, so whereas cubic zirconia and diamonds, they are both singly refractive. So when the light passes through the stone, the light doesn't split. So okay. whenever, yeah, whenever you see a cubic zirconia through one of the facets, you will only see one line. Mm. Okay, so that oh, is... Thanks for mm -hmm. explaining it. Yeah, it's pretty simple. It's, uh, I, I mean, if you have a magnifier, you can get a loop. You can get uh, a single lens. I mean, at best, yeah, loop would be better because stones can be quite small. Yeah. Mm, yes. Okay, so next question. Okay, any questions so far, Kumi? So far, uh, everybody is saying, oh, good info about zircons. And then... Uh, yeah, I think no questions. Let's go. Mm, okay. Anyway, uh, those of you who have uh, uh, friends who like this, uh, just uh, share, like and share our video, tag their names, and uh, yeah, enjoy our lunchtime jam talk. <laughs> Wonder what you're all having for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't, make, don't make me hungry. <laughs> 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 all right, so here is the re uh, summary of um, the QB and Zirconia. Uh, saga, okay, let's call it saga. Saga, right. wow. <laughs> well, zircon is natural, uh, vitreous, uh, to sub adamantine, moderate fire, doubly, uh, doubly refractive, which shows strong doubling, may have natural inclusions and does not fluoresce. Whereas cubic zirconia is a man made, it has a sub adamantine luster, strong fire, 
as distinctly refractive stone, which doesn't show doubling, mostly flawless and they fluoresce. Oh, what do you mean by fluoresce? Huh? Okay, fluoresce is that they would glow when you shine a UV light on them. Oh, wow, cool. Go, yes. No, normally, what color? A... I think orange, uh, like yellow, yeah. orange. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I, I think so. I think so. Yeah. So it's actually quite a good indicator, lah. I mean, if you put two stones together, you shine a light. Diamond also can fluoresce yellow orange mm. too, you know. And uh, mm. and zirconia is a cornea. It's quite a yeah. strong one, so it's a good indicator if you are if you are looking at some stones. Mm. Could you use uh the fluorescence to differentiate cubic zirconia and diamond? Well, you you got me there, man. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't, th I don't think. I think maybe you can, you know, maybe you can, but uh, they are quite similar, you know. So mm. you really have to be very careful. But I, I love UV light, la. UV light is something that I I love to play with. Mm, yeah, yeah, it's it's fun. I mean, I remember when we first got the UV light, we just shine on every single stone that we have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So fun. okay, let's go on right. the next slide. Oh, still have. A... Oh, this side is nice. All the different colors of the different uh, zircon, uh, natural oh. zircon. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. These are on all the colors that uh that is possible to 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 be found in a zircon. Okay, and it's yeah, it's very very colorful, and right, cubic zircon can be highly collectible with reasonable price, and yes, they are not that expensive. Not as expensive as like you know, ruby, sapphire, uh, diamond. Yeah, it's like, I think a couple of hundred dollars, or even slightly less than a hundred dollars a carat. You know, mm. it's a very reasonable price stone. I mean, of course, there are also diamond cut ones. Uh, normally, diamond cut ones they are cut, they 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 cost more because there's a much more wastage. And then, uh, you know, when you buy zircons, they normally have a very thick bottom. So yeah, maybe when it's very thick, then the prices it goes down or. Yeah, but it really depends on the individual stone, and mm. uh, but it's still very collectible because there's so many different colors and uh, and they are pretty uh, pretty reasonably pretty priced. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've seen some of the zircons that you sold before. It was really amazing. I mean, yeah, I mean huge ones, and it doesn't really cost a lot, like maybe less yeah. than thousand mm. dollars. Joanna has a question. She said, "What is the hardness of zircon?" Zircon is around 7 to 7.5. I mean, it can be lower yeah, depending yeah. on what grade. What the, kind of zircon. zircon? What type of zircon it is. Yes, that's yeah. right. Mm, 7.5. Yeah. yeah, whereas cubic zirconia is around 8. Ooh, so it's harder. Cubic zirconia is harder. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, um, in, in the end, uh, natural zircons are severely misunderstood because of cubic zirconia. Um, like, uh, the name itself, it kind of confuses people. So people would think cubic zirconia is zircon and zircons, they're man-made. So yeah, that causes a lot of misunderstanding on natural zircons. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, when you, when you say, I heard you have a 33 carat rate zircon. Uh, I, I have a 33, a 30 something carat, uh, like an orange zircon, uh, very nice, beautiful piece. In the museum. Wow. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, the last one that we're gonna cover is emerald, right? Okay, Which... pause, uh, pause for a while. So <laughs> everybody, if you know our friends who like emeralds, uh, do like and share our video with them because uh, we're just gonna talk a little bit about emeralds and uh, yeah, it's uh, the last topic of our lunchtime jam talk. Thank you very much all of you for <laughs> staying with us. Uh, yeah, let's continue to go on to emeralds. Andrew. Okay. So right again well, these last time you I think you you put you lost weight there. Eh? I think during the circuit breaker you you you, you put like more chubby, <laughs> yeah. I think I think everyone gained weight during this the circuit <laughs> breaker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah right. now everybody has been traveling back to work, it's you know, a lot of a lot more walking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Okay, so then again, uh, we're going to share some of the uh, often asked questions on 
the webinar topics. So Emerald, a, one of the most common questions that we have is why does Emerald almost always have fracture? And uh, is it possible to, for it to be eye clean? Okay, so we're gonna answer the first one first. A emerald, yes, almost all of the emerald will have fractures. Okay, it's just oh. how the nature of the formation of emeralds and some sometimes even how they mine for the di uh, emerald itself. A you know uh, through harsh methods like dynamites, explosive um, drillings. These kind of methods can actually damage uh, the crystal itself by causing more mm -hmm. fractures. And uh, yeah, upon more research on the emerald itself, some research actually says the you know how the chemical within the emerald actually you know causes the fracture during the formation. For example, like the aluminium within the emerald is um, you know kinds of well maybe it's not for me to explain. Yeah, um. I'm not a chemistry based student. <laughs> okay, so it's just how it is, how natural creates emerald in a way that it will have a lot of fractures. Same like red barrel as well. Red barrel, they have a specific chemical that creates a lot of fractures. So it's, um, yeah. Mm. I think and that the, the chemical could be chromium also, right? Yes, it could be chromium because it's more heavy. Yeah. Mm. So the next one would be: Is it emerald? Uh, is it possible for emerald to be eye clean? I have seen one eye clean emerald before in an auction house back in UK, and it was really hard to believe. Really, I mean, from what we all learn, what we all seen, emerald would have some kind of fractures and fissures and inclusions. But when you see an eye clean emerald, you you really doubt yourself: is this really emerald? You know, but yeah, have you seen an eye clean emerald before, Kumi? Oh yeah, I have seen. Um, in fact, we have one in our collection, in uh, the gemstone of the world exhibit. Uh, it's a mm -hmm. Russian emerald, that is a very light. It's a light green, but not yet that light to be called green barrel. It's still emerald. It's very clean. It's almost like flawless. And then I think on the start it says no oil, because uh, there's no fracture for the oil to go in. Uh, yeah, I also, I also, it's, it's very rare to, to find uh, a nice green emerald with uh, uh, totally eye clean, you know, without fractures and all this. Mm. Uh, normally, if you find something like that, the color is usually lighter. Like uh, those from uh, Colombia, uh, you can find like light green kind of emeralds that are pretty clean. Maybe there's a correlation with the color, maybe less chromium, uh, you know. And maybe then it caused it to be uh, uh, less fractures. But uh, most of the time, they have a lot of fractures. But because of the vivid green, the deep green color, it kind of masks all of these uh, uh, fractures. And on top of that, there's also oiling, you know. When they oil it, they put resin or they put um, oil on it. It, it kind of uh, masks it. And actually, when I mean, you look at the stone, right, because it's an emerald, so everybody has a preconceived idea. Oh, yeah, this sure has some inclusion. They are more for giving, you know, mm. for, for mm. emeralds, yeah. Yeah, so indeed, the vivid coloration of the emerald can mask the fractures. So in the end, when it comes to colored stone, what's the most important thing is the color of the stone. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, speaking of oil treatment, um, are emerald heat treated? I never wow. heard of this. I never seen one before, but uh, generally emeralds are not heat treated. Okay, in fact they are oil, as uh, Komi mentioned. So yeah, um, most emerald, I would say majority, like maybe ninety nine percent of emerald, they are oil in a certain degree. It could be minor, it could be significant. Yeah, depending on how much fracture it originally has, you know. So um, oiling, it does improve the emerald's clarity and also improve its stability as well. So it's uh, it's almost like heat treating to, you know, mm. improve its quality so of the stone. 
Mm. Yeah, you know the melting point for uh, emerald is 850 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Whereas uh, a lot of heat treatment for rubies and sapphires is 1,800 degrees Celsius. So, you know, you, if you heat it, one thing also because uh, uh, this, uh, one, one thing about uh, emeralds is that it has a lot of fractures. Then you heat it, right? Then you the fractures will crack and then it will cause mm. the stone to be break, breaking apart, broken apart. Lah. So uh, oiling is a much better treatment and uh, more more cost effective too. Okay. Right. So actually, that's all for for the questions that we have. A. Oh, okay. Any questions yeah. from the audience? Yeah. Hi everyone. So uh, thank you very much for joining us so far, and uh, we are almost at the end of our gem talk. Uh, you can actually connect with us on on Facebook on youtube and instagram and uh yeah do do let us know about uh, any questions that you have or any topics they are interested in uh we are our next uh our next um our next lunchtime gem talk will be on next week at the same time wednesday 12 p.m to 1 p.m and we're going to talk about the feldspar group phenomena of feldspar group like moonstones colorful world of opal the most desirable cat's eye crystal barrel and also facts about peridot the august birthstone so do join us uh same time next week at uh, 12 to 1 pm and uh yeah i, I let, please let us know what uh if you enjoyed today's uh today's uh, talk and uh in the comments they just type in there yes i enjoy or you know just uh mm -hmm. let us know and, uh, yeah uh Andrew, can you switch back to the 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 not not the slide but you can see the stream app. Then you can look at your face, you can look at my face. So I stop share. Yeah, you stop share. Yeah. Okay. Oh Mohammed says yes, thank you. Thanks for joining us, <laughs> Mohammed. Yeah, do like and share our video and uh, our it will be on our our page for for, the, for you to share with people who have some questions about this and uh, yeah we are here to inspire com uh, conversations yeah, about gemstones and uh, talk about more of these uh, gemstones because uh, I guess it's really fun uh, Andrew mm -hmm. talking yes, about it is. stones mm. you know like if you don't know about it you talk about it then slowly slowly you know start to you know start to talk to different people and then different people like ask questions like so, so, so somebody asked about labs there's some people ask about the the the, the papraja different between the different names of papraja and then also um going ask about the prices you know for sapphire now i think prices generally uh, are going up la, for all the stones because of all the disruptions in the supply chain last time we used to have a lot of dealers coming from all over southeast asia coming to singapore you know but nowadays because we are closed so a lot of dealers are they can't send they only send their stones to some trusted people and then the brokers will go and uh sell the stones. So I, I I guess also the logistic cost also is going up. So definitely value of stones are, are increasing. But of course, you know, there's always uh somewhere you can find a good deal and all these things lah. You know. Mm -hmm. Any 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 uh thoughts you have, Andrew? A um Well, not, not. I don't have any thoughts now. <laughs> yeah, we got, we got. Uh, actually, it's, uh, yeah. I think it's fun, uh. I mean, like what you said. Some sometimes people people might ask some unsuspecting questions, and then you're like, oh, never thought of that before. You know, I mean, yeah, that's the fun of like connecting with people. Like different people have different mindset altogether, and then eventually you will learn yourself. You know. Yeah. It's good to be curious, uh. and mm -hmm. especially in gemstones, it's a very niche kind of thing. It's not like something that uh, you have every day, you know, you know. But, so that's why it's good to talk about it. That's why we created the Gem Museum. Our Gem Museum's uh, vision is to be an international platform to, to bridge the gap between the gemstone industry, gems and jewelry industry, and the rest of the world. So uh, do come and visit us. Uh, you can go to event, let me just type it down, uh, the gemmuseum.event.com 
eventbrite.com to book their tickets. Uh, we, we are using the Eventbrite right now because uh, of the safe management measures and also to, to make sure to control the crowd. And uh, currently, uh, we are until, only until next, we are, we are operating at 25% capacity and we only can able to start uh, at 50% at capacity, I think on the 19th of August. So uh, do, do, do book your slots early. And uh, we have exciting uh, events coming up. Uh, next week, we have the same time, same channel, uh, Let Jamstone Lunch Talk. And also we have Zooming In with Gems. So you all can go to the Eventbrite also. There's a Zooming Into Gems and we're going to talk about Tanzanite. Yeah, wow, Tanzanite, very interesting. Mm. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I think that's about it for today. Uh, if you all have any questions, do we just wait for a few more moments. If anybody has any questions, Hui says, good chat today. Yeah, we missed you at the museum. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's great to, to talk about gemstones. And sometimes, you know, I think last time one of the issues with gemstone trade is not enough connectivity and communication. Hmm. And then a lot of times, you know, you, you're, you're really not sure, you know. Nowadays, you got well, Facebook groups, uh, you know, places where you can post your questions, talk about things, you know. Yeah, and even true. a lot of websites uh, uh, there are, that you can actually find good information on. What's, what's some of the websites uh, that you recommend for, for getting good information on minerals? Information. A, the one that I always always refer to is the geology.com. Oh, geology.com. Uh, yeah, they do have a lot of um, significant gemstones. Uh, and they also talk about minerals. They also talk about rocks. So you definitely can learn a lot of things on that website. And uh, if you re really want to know the in-depth information of minerals and gemstones, you can go to mindat, which is M-I-N-D-A-T.com, or gemdat as well. I think mean that's the ORG. Oh, yeah, ORG. Yeah, yeah, yeah ORG. Yeah, yeah mean that I mean and was... gem that ORG. Mm. Gem that. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah. So, okay. Thanks, everyone. And uh, see you, till next week. Uh, see you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs> Bye, everyone.